Good morning, Christchurch, and happy Sunday. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Carol. Hey, and I'm Melissa. We're hanging out here in the atrium here at Christchurch. Yes, Very welcome exciting. back. We don't have any confetti or we glitter don't. today, but we had a great time last Sunday. I hope you're here um, again, or if you missed it, go back and watch. It was, it was pretty a, cool. It was, it was a great really time. Good. Last yeah. week was awesome. Yes, even just for the confetti yeah. growing at the beginning. The you glitter go back and watch everywhere. It. Absolutely, it was fun. Well, I want to say thank you for all of you who are joining us for the very first time. Thanks for hanging out with us. Welcome. We're really glad that you're with us, and we would love to get to know you. No pressure at all, but when you're ready, we'd love to connect with you. And the best way for you to do that is in the worship center, you'll see a black tag on the back of the chair. You just take your phone and tap that to the, um, the tag, and it'll bring up a link where you can connect with us. And then head out to the hub right behind us after service today for your free gift. And those of you watching online, we will post a link in the chat so you can connect with us as well. I want to say hello to everyone who's watching from all over the country today. We're glad you're with us too. And I heard even all over the world. All so over the world, yeah. We got some inter- people from our um, country watching too. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to my family in Canada. I know they watch and tune in. Nice. Um, very exciting. Well, it's also very exciting because today we are starting a new series yes. called Stress Fractures. Yes. I know this is going to surprise absolutely zero of you, but even the people in scripture could not get their relationships right all the time. No. The Bible is full of imperfect people being used by a perfect God. And this is another great yes. example in this in this series. And one that we can all really relate yeah. to because I know that I mess up and yeah. I have relationships that yeah. have tensions and things that I have to navigate as same, well. So same. I'm really excited to dive into this and, and see what God has for us. So we're super excited for that there. And I think there are workbooks available. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got workbooks. So we're jumping back into Genesis. Gen- is yeah. it Genesis Volume 2? Yes, Volume 2. Yep. So you need Start a, a collection. new Genesis workbook. Yep. So we've got this for sale today, or we've got a a free link. We'll post that in the chat for those of you who are watching online or just want to download it from home. We'll we'll have that available. And also, in addition to workbooks, those go along with our groups. Yeah, Carol, it's group season. Segway. Absolutely. Segway right into it. You're in a group on Wednesday night? I am. Yeah. I am in a group. Awesome. So we've got Wednesday night groups that start this Wednesday night. We also have groups um, that meet all throughout the week in people's homes and online. So, online folks, you can join as well and that will those groups will go along with the series so you can really talk dive into what you're dealing with with your relationships and have some people to walk alongside you because the last thing we want is for you to walk along walk through the series by yourself we want you to walk alongside with others yeah exactly we're designed to be in community yeah. definitely if you're not in a group there's a group center right outside the worship center if you have questions or want to know about a group that might work for you definitely check that out absolutely um we also have on our cc tag so if you are in a worship center um our events page is now on our cc tags we have a lot of awesome events coming up yes. for all ages so if you want to know what's coming up you want to get involved you want to bring the friends out because again these are awesome opportunities mm-hmm. to invite your five i yeah. know we say that a lot but invite your five there's awesome events for example tacos and trivia for yes. women is, is this, this friday, friday mm-hmm. at fleming and mandarin yes and i'm a trivia like nerd i love oh, doing it yeah. so i didn't win last year but this is my this you're is my redemption redeem year yeah, i gotta redeem i gotta okay. redeem this yeah, absolutely yeah so come see carol if you're a woman come see carol on friday night uh, for Tacos and Trivia. Check out all those events. And I'm going to actually be at our Monday night service tomorrow night. Yeah, Very exciting. So we're, we're, we're all over the place this week. So not that people come to church to see us, but, you know, come say hi to us. We'd yeah. love to say hi to you. We'd love to meet new folks. Um, this Monday night, we're kicking off the brand new series. So maybe you liked watching today. You want to come in person tomorrow night. It starts at 630 and get this, there's free ice cream afterwards. I'll be there. Yes, free ice cream. I'll so be there. you should come to church just for free ice cream tomorrow night. So I mean, that's not the only reason. No, that's not a, the only reason, but it's a really great it's thing. It's a really great follow up to a really awesome exactly. it's bookending. Exactly. Monday night's kind of creating its own community and it's, it's just got a, a really laid back, kind of fun feel. It is. It's really awesome. Yeah, so we'd love for you to join us. And so come for service at 6 30, stay afterwards for ice cream tomorrow night. Yeah, we also have for, speaking of free things, we, for CC Kids, we actually have free snow cones today. So if you're in the Jacksonville area, you have kids uh, and you want to give them free snow cones for breakfast because, you know, school's not started yet. So technically there are still no rules. Um, Come and get a free snow cone at the 11 o'clock service. And, you know, things like this, like Monday night service, uh, the 50 50 years of Christ Church, all of that could not happen without continued giving and partnership to the ministry and kingdom work of of what we're doing here in Jacksonville. So we just want to say thank you. If you call Christchurch your home, 
thank you for your continued giving and partnership. And if you are just visiting or new to Christ Church, there is no obligation to give. But if you do feel led, you can give via the CC tags, the giving kiosks around campus, or give online as well. We're just glad that you're here, though, so no pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, today um, we're, we're starting this new series, and after the message, we will take communion together like we do every single week to remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. So if you're coming into the worship center, make sure you grab your communion kit on your way in. If you're watching from home, make sure you grab some crackers and juice, um, a bagel, coffee, whatever you have so you can remember that moment with us. Stay online after the message and be a part of that moment with us. Also on the way in, you'll receive a prayer card that's part of the service today. Um, Pastor Jason will lead us through that a little bit later. If you're online, we'll post that link as well a little bit later in the service so you can be a part of that. Yep, well, it is that time. It is 9.30, yeah. so if you are in our worship center, stand up, yep. say hi to someone yeah. around you, give some fist bumps, give some high fives, stretch it out. I know it's early. Yeah. Um, if you're joining us online, say hi in the chat, and let's get ready to worship. We love you, church. Yep. Happy Sunday.
Jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that
Hallelujah. Do you know that there's no power like the power of Jesus? Hallelujah. Do you really believe that on this morning? Don't we serve an amazing God, an amazing Father, an amazing Savior, an amazing healer, an amazing deliverer? Hallelujah. Do you know that the Lord has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind? Do y'all believe that this morning? Because we are children of God, no fear can live within us. We have the choice to believe in God our Father. We have the choice to believe in the things that he has for us. Anything else that comes up, it will fail because we are God's children. Do I have a witness of that this morning? Do I have a witness of that this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone why Cause i'm no longer a slave to fear i am a child of god do i have a witness of that this morning I'm no longer a slave I am a child of God. Oh, yeah. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born.
God. Can I sing that one more time? Oh, 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 oh. oh my life, you have been faithful. Has the Lord been faithful to anyone here? And oh my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, Lord, I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord, I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, we're here this morning humbling our hearts, humbling our spirits, humbling our souls to praise you and to sing of your goodness, to sing of your marvelous works towards us. God, we can't say thank you enough for everything that you've done for us. You've done so many wonderful and, and great things for each and every one of us that stands here before you. And all we can say is thank you. Thank you for your rescue. Thank you for your deliverance. Thank you for your salvation. We know that without you, we would fail. Without you, we would make it. We would not make it. Without you, we would be like a ship without a sail. But because we have you, we have hope. Because we have you, we know that we have faith. Because we have you, we know that our love, our love is endless. The love that you have for us, that reckless love, it will continue to keep us. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here, everyone that is watching. Touch the word, oh God. Allow, allow it to be penetrating to our hearts. Allow it to affect us in a way that will cause us to change and to be more and more like you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask this in all blessings. Let everyone say amen. amen. You may have your seats. My name is Becky Bennett and I came to Mandarin in 1988. I went to the one and only campus we had uh, over on Old St. Augustine Road. I was the first children's minister here. I'd grown up in a preacher's family and uh, Learning to love the Lord was just like breathing to me because my family just infused that into me. And I became a Christian when I was 10 years old. But it probably wasn't until I was in college that I really began to make faith my faith and not just something that our family did. But a few years later, I, uh, I was looking to leave where I was and wasn't sure where to go. And Dennis Bratton called me and uh, wanted me to come down to Florida to be the first children's minister here. Well, I, I wasn't sure that was the right thing to do because it was so far away. I had no intention of moving that far away from home. But Dennis was very convincing and I was so excited about what was happening at Mandarin. He told me about the growth and the area that was growing so fast and I was intrigued. And so I made the trek to, to Mandarin and I'm so glad that I did. Those first years were tough years. We were growing so fast. It was, I'd never been so busy in my life, but it was great. But one of the things I loved the most was the way I grew spiritually while I was here. Um, just digging deeper, deeper into God's Word, being in small groups, uh, getting to go to classes like Experiencing God. I was growing uh, the time that I was here because sometimes it's difficult in ministry to grow because you're giving so much. And I really appreciated um, the ways that I was able to to grow in my faith while I was here. And it was, it made a huge impact and difference in my life. Christ Church has always been a church that serves. Um, that goes way back to the very beginning when the church was young. It's been a church that got out into the community and served. And I think that is essential for any church to do. And I love the way that this church is still doing that after all these years. And I just encourage you to continue that because you're showing Jesus in this community. Um, you're letting them know that this is a church that isn't 
asking you for anything. It's, it's there to, to give and to serve you. And that's how people come to know, uh, come to know Jesus. So I encourage you, whether it's on your own or through a program, get out there and serve. Being a staff member and a member of this church for almost 20 years was some of the best experiences of my life. And I want to thank all of you for being part of my life, building into my life, and just just loving on me those years and continuing to do that now. And I wish the very best for Christ Church. Uh, well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Christ Church. It's so good to see you here today. If you're new around here, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, whether you're here in person or maybe you're watching online, uh, whether you're a first-time guest or you're returning for the first time in a long time, I'm so thrilled that you're with us today. And, and I'd love to get to know you. Our team would love to get to know you across our campuses. And the easy way to do that, no matter where you might be watching from right now, you can just take out your phone and tap that seat back in front of you and get connected with one of our team. We would love to get you at starting point next week, an opportunity for you to kind of get to know who we are and what God's doing and find out how you can get plugged in. And man, speaking of getting plugged in, uh, Becky did a great job just kind of giving me a, a toss-up segue to be able to hit here. Man, this is a fun season. We have celebrated an amazing summer. God's been doing some great things around this church, and there's been so many new faces and faces coming back through the summer. That sets us up for an amazing fall, but what we need is exactly what Becky talked about. We need a few people to jump in and say, hey, I I'm ready to serve. Uh, I'm ready to jump in and be a part of what God's doing around here on a Sunday morning. And there are two areas we always are looking for some volunteers. One, it's our first impressions team, those people who, who make this place so warm and friendly when you walk through the doors, and we need it on our kids' team. As we have been growing and as back to school is here, we've got so many kids that God is bringing here, and so we need some volunteers. And listen, when we ask for volunteers, sometimes it's, it's just you know one time a month, or it could be every week. But we're not asking you to commit till Jesus comes back. We're just saying, would you jump in and be a part of what God's doing around here? So we'd love to have you serve. You can sign up anytime. All you gotta do is text the word serve to that number, 904-204-2876. And we'd love to have you a part of our team. And also this time of the year, we got so many things for you to get plugged in. We're kicking off groups. That's right, we're kicking off groups this week as we jump back into Genesis. So if you're not in a group, get in a group. We got groups happening anywhere, everywhere, all throughout Northeast Florida, just about every day of the week. If you can't make one outside, we got ones inside. Wednesday nights with childcare, love to get you there. Love to get you to hang out with us as we continue to unpack God's word. I know one of the highlights of my week is going to my small group every single week. And if you're not in one, you need to get in one because it's the best way to grow to become more and more like Jesus. And so speaking of getting things started, man, uh, last week we kicked off 50 years of, of ministry here at Christ Church. It was a great weekend, and thank you so much to everyone who came last week. We're a part of last week's service. Thank you to all those who read. That's right, the week leading up to last week, we read from Genesis all the way through the end of Revelation, read through the entire Bible across our campuses. It was an awesome thing. Thanks to all of our volunteers that helped us at every campus, and thanks Mike Stapleton. I don't know if Mike's here this morning or not. Mike's a guy that helped me build that cross right up there, and uh, really grateful. Yeah, come on now. Let's thank Mike Stapleton. I don't know if he's here this morning or not, but uh, so grateful for Mike and his help. And what a fun time as we're celebrating 50 years of doing ministry. And you saw Becky, uh, one of our longtime staff members back in the day. And you're going to see many faces, some familiar, some new as we go through this exciting year. Well, we're going to jump back in. That's my segue to get back into uh, the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them now to Genesis chapter 25. You have your workbooks. Go ahead and open those to one of the opening pages in our workbooks in Genesis chapter 25. And so just to catch everybody up, uh, if you've been with us or not, of where we've been throughout this year is we made a decision that as we go back to the beginning of our history as a church, what a neat thing to do is go back to the beginning of our history as believers. Go back to the beginning in our Bible, to the book of Genesis. So in January, we jumped into Genesis chapter one, and we went for the first couple weeks where most churches are afraid to go. We jumped into Genesis chapter one through 11, and boy, oh boy, did we wade into some deep waters. As we talked about creation, as we talked about, about men and women in marriage, we talked about the fall, we talked about God's plan for redemption and salvation, and we talked about Noah and the flood and the, the peoples of the earth. We jumped into some amazing things. 
And so if you weren't with us during that season, it's still online, go back and give it a watch, give it a listen, jumped in some great stuff. But as we came out of that series, Origins, we jumped into the first of four patriarchs that we see in the book of Genesis. We started looking at the life of this guy by the name of Abraham. Abraham was this guy that God called from a faraway place and said, follow me, I'll make a covenant with you to make your name great, to to make you a a great nation and to bless the whole entire world through you. And and so Abraham left Ur and moved to this place known as the promised land and he began to walk with God. But what we saw from Abraham's life is it was a messy process. I mean, we've learned that, that we are all works in progress. That sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back, and we see this faith journey that Abraham is on with God where he's learning to trust God in in, in every situation, in every area of his life. And it's just messy, but thank goodness. Thank goodness for the promise we have from God that he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And so God just did this work in the life of Abraham. We got to the end of his life and we might remember there were two things that he wanted to do before he died. Number one, he wanted to buy some property in the promised land. I mean, at this point, they were Hebrew. They were nomads. They were wanderers. And they owned no property in the promised land. And Sarah's about to, or just died. And he says, I want to buy some property in the promised land to bury my wife and my family. And so number one, he buys some property. But then number two, he wants to find a good wife for his son, Isaac. And so we see Abraham accomplish those two things. And the Bible says that in his old age, he lived this successful and happy life. And so we now transition into his son, Isaac's life. And here's what you're gonna see right off the bat. This guy's life is a mess, not just inside of his household, but outside of his house. Because everywhere he goes, he has a hard time managing his relationships. And maybe you can understand, maybe you can relate with Isaac, who's got some issues in his household. He's got some issues with the relationships with his, his spouse. He's got some relationships with issues with his kids. And you're gonna see some with his, his in-laws. You're gonna see some relationship issues inside of his house. But you're also gonna see some relationship issues outside of his house um, with like coworkers and, and, and people in the community. And, and so maybe you can relate to Isaac because maybe in your life, you've got a few relationship issues too. Maybe there's some stress at home or maybe there's some stress at work or maybe just beneath the surface that stress has been building and building and building and now those relationships are maybe just a little bit fractured. I mean, here's what I know and here's what you know. Our lives are filled with relationships. Everywhere we go, everywhere we turn, everything in our lives is about relationships. And I don't know about you, but it seems like to me in my life that the greatest stress in my life comes from relationships. And so one of the threads that we're gonna be pulling as we jump back into the book of Genesis is how we can get some some rehabilitation for some of our stressed out and fractured relationships. Because here's what I need you to understand. Relationship problems are normal, but they're not insurmountable. Relationship problems are normal, but they're not insurmountable. And here's the truth, all right? We're gonna learn more from Isaac and Jacob's failures than we are from their victories. Because these guys are gonna make some blunders. These guys are gonna make some mistakes. These guys are going to pass some things on to their sons and to their grandsons and daughters that that are not good and are not healthy. And have you ever noticed that about our relationships? That so many of our relationships are marked by the things that we might have learned, that we might have acquired from our parents or from our grandparents. That, that the skills we have that we apply, the things that we do, many times they're just passed on. They're generational things. They're, they're things that, that run in the family. But please hear me as we start this series, and I need you to hear me clearly when I say this, all right? Just because it runs through your family doesn't mean it has to run through you. Amen? Why? Because you are a new creation in Christ, amen? You are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And so just because we might have some things in our family that runs through our family, it can stop with you. And so as we jump into this series, we're gonna really tackle some of these things and learn a little bit from these guys and learn a little bit from our lives because I don't know about you, but I've been there. I mean, I always say I have white hair because I had teenagers. I don't know about anybody else. Can I get an amen from some of the parents of teenagers? Amen, all right, good. I, mean, I love my boys. I have two great boys, so proud of the young men that they've become. But back when they were in high school, man, oh man, did they just drive me nuts sometimes. Because, you know, it's, it's like one day, it's, you know, day of, of Hurricane Matthews coming to town. 
And all of a sudden I get phone calls from people, not just in Jacksonville, but all around the country, that my son, who I told to stay at home, who is on national TV doing an interview because he's driven his truck down by Clark's Fish Camp into the water. And I'm like, are, are you kidding me? Well, or one day I, I, get a, I, I get a text message from my second son who says, hey dad, I just drove into some water, what should I do? You know, or I get another text message from the head of security around here at Christ Church who sends me this picture and says, hey, do you recognize this vehicle? It's been doing donuts in the parking lots. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And as a dad, I'm like, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And here's the thing, I, I, I have the privilege of working with a few people that know me from way back. And, and I'll go to them, I'll say, I cannot believe what my kids did. Can you believe they did this? And they'll look at me and they'll start laughing. And then they'll say this phrase, like father? I'm like, yeah, you're right, you're right. And so as we jump into today, this is that, that phrase that we are gonna see over and over again, like father, like son, because so many things when it comes to relationships, we just pass down. And so let's jump into the life of Isaac. If you have your Bibles, we're gonna pick up in verse 19, and here is what it captures. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Apatim Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean. And so maybe you remember this story, maybe you remember back in the earlier part of our, 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 our walk through the book of Genesis, where, where Isaac meets Rebekah for the first time, their eyes meet out in the fields, they run and embrace, and, and they, they begin this relationship. So now we fast forward about 20 years, and Rebekah is pregnant, but she's pregnant with twins. She's pregnant with twins. Verse 24, let's pick up. It says, and when time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. You see, they did not have ultrasounds back then, all right? So sometimes they took birth to figure that out. So the first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. And so she has twins, Rebecca has twins, and this family now immediately doubles overnight. And the Bible records that the first twin that came out is this son that they named Esau. And Esau literally means red. And the Bible describes him as, as, as having so much hair that it was like he was wearing a fur coat. You see, Esau's the guy you see at the beach walking down the beach that looks like he's wearing a sweater, right? You're like, whoa. And so evidently that's Esau. And, and his name means Red, And then we have the, his brother, Jacob, who the Bible described that he was grasping the heel of his brother when he was born. And so Jacob literally translates heel grabber or trickster. Trickster, because that's what we're gonna see Jacob is. We're gonna see that this isn't just a name, that this is the way this guy lives his entire life. And so these two sons come out, one is older than the other. Which one was the first one? Was it Esau or Jacob? is Esau, hold on to that, because this is going to play a major role in this story. This brother that was born like 30 seconds to a minute before the other, that 30 seconds to a minute makes a huge difference because the firstborn was important. And, and so the Bible goes on to describe these two a little bit more. Listen to what it says in verse 27. It said, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. So have you ever had this parents, had the same parents, you have kids and they're completely different. They're completely opposite. You're like, how in the world from the same two people do we make two little people who are completely opposite? And so that's what's going on here. And the Bible describes Esau as like a, a man's man. I mean, he's that rugged outdoorsman. He, you know, he drives that jacked up truck and he wears cowboy boots. He loves to watch wrestling. You know, he loves to go shoot and kill things. And odds are strong that he probably had a mullet. I'm just saying, all right? He's a rugged outdoorsman. But then Jacob is described completely different. He doesn't make war, he makes peace. And the Bible says that he's not a big fan of vitamin D. He likes the AC. 
He would rather stay inside, and he's a big fan of Gordon Ramsay and, and Bobby Flay. He, he likes to cook. And, and the Bible describes him as not having calluses on his hand, which is code for he doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting, not a lot of manual labor. So these two boys are completely different. And these differences, these differences are going to lead to an, a huge split and fracture in their family. Now here's the deal, and I think a lot of us understand this because a lot of us have people in our lives that have some differences. Maybe we have different temperaments or different personalities. Uh, we have different likes, we have different dislikes, or, 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 or maybe we have different worldviews. And, and the fact that we have differences isn't a bad thing if we manage and give grace to those differences, but when we don't, it leads to problems. I mean, husbands and wives, how many of you are different than one another? And how many of you have had some issues when it comes to making decisions on parenting your kids because you are two completely different human beings? And how many times has it led to something like, what, what were you thinking? Why did you do it that way? I wouldn't have done it that way. Oh, you're just like your mother or you're just like your father. Then ding, 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 let's get ready to rumble, right? Because we don't manage those differences well. But here we have these two boys who are very different and mom and dad should have helped bring these two boys together but instead they throw gasoline on the fire. Let's pick up as we continue. Listen to what it says as we continue on. Verse 28, it says this. It says, Isaac loved, say loved. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved, say loved. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And so now you have these two boys with some differences and now those differences are compounded because mom and dad choose sides. I mean, Isaac looks at his son, son Esau and he's like, man, I'm gonna lean towards him. I'm going to favor him. I'm going to love him a little bit more. And then Rebecca does the same thing. She looks at her son Jacob, says, I'm gonna lean towards him. I'm going to favor him. I'm gonna love him a little bit more. And you see favoritism play out in this family. And Isaac should have known better. I mean, if anybody grew up in a household where there was favoritism, it was Isaac. But again, like father, like son. You see, Isaac grew up in a household with a half-brother by the name of Ishmael. And the differences between Isaac and, 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 and Ishmael were, were vast. And his father, Abraham, definitely made him the favorite. And it led to some incredible tensions that led to some, some pretty harsh things happening. And those tensions and, and that fracture has gone on for generation and generation and generation and generation and generation and generation, and it still goes on today. You say, what do you mean? Because every expert of the Bible will tell you that this is where the conflict between Muslims and Jews began. Because Abraham played favorites. So if anybody knew better, Isaac knew better. But it's not just on Isaac, because Rebecca, she played a part in this as well. But Isaac is the one who grew up in a household, saw how, how it played out when you treat somebody as a favorite. He should have led better in this situation, but he doesn't. And so what he does is he begins to pass on these generational things to his sons. And guess what? Jacob is going to do the exact same thing that his dad and his granddad did. He's going to play favorites. Later in the year, we get into the life of Joseph. We're gonna see how Jacob did the exact same thing. And what it lead to? Attempted murder and another almost two decade rift between the family. And we're gonna see the same thing happen with Esau here. Esau, he just becomes spiritually like, like blah. He's like, who cares about the things of God? And he decides to take wives, two wives who, who are outside of, of their people, two pagan wives, and to make the trifecta, he, he goes ahead and takes a third wife from someone outside of their people people. And in chapter 26, I love this, how the Bible is so true. It says that, that the daughters-in-law, they made Rebecca and Isaac's life miserable. The daughters-in-law. I mean, this is what happens. And, and here's the thing. Isaac's life started out with so much promise. I mean, he was like the promised one. He was like the chosen one. He was like the miracle baby because here's Abraham and Sarah unable to give birth to a child. Yet God made this covenant that one day he was gonna be the father of a great multitude, of a great nation, and his kids are outnumber the, the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky, and they have no child. And then when Abraham is 100 years old, Sarah is 90 years old, she gets pregnant, and they have this son by the name of Isaac. And then you have the whole walk towards Mount Moriah 
where Abraham takes uh, to Isaac to Mount Moriah because God said, I need you to sacrifice your son to me. And then there's that, that miraculous last minute where God provides the ram. I mean, then God uh, miraculously gives him this incredible wife in Rebecca. And so if anybody's life started out on the right path, it was Isaac. But the moment we meet him here, I mean, the things of God no longer matter to him. His heart has gone cold for the things of God. He's only worried about himself and his protection. And it's leading to some massive issues in his family. And and parents, we get this. Parents, I think we all understand this because if we have multiple children, we all say, you know what? We love each of our kids equally, right? But if we're being honest, there's usually a kid or two that we might relate to a little bit more than the others. It's not because we love them more. It's because sometimes they're just more like us. We have the same temperament, the same personality, the the same uh, same sense of humor, the same likes and dislikes. And so we may gravitate, we may lean towards one of our kids, but then it's our responsibility to make sure we bridge the gap with the others, right? To make sure they don't feel like we're treating one or other as a favorite. Isaac had an opportunity in this story to to lean in. I mean, he could have sit down and he could have watched Hell's Kitchen or the Great Bake Off with Jacob, right? And bridge the gap maybe a little bit, but he doesn't. And what does he do? He just makes this rift, this break in this family, this tension even greater. And here's the sad truth. Isaac knew this was gonna happen. What do you mean, what do you mean Isaac knew? Because Rebecca was told by God that this was gonna happen. Listen to what it says back at the beginning of this, verse 23. It says, and the Lord told her, talking about Rebecca, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And so before they ever had these two sons, they already knew what was gonna happen, but Isaac wanted it the other way around. He favored, he favored Esau, and so he wanted Esau. And so he's like, God, I don't care what you say, this is what I want. But this sets the table for this tension and this division within this family. Well, listen to what happens in verse 29. It says, one day when Jacob was, was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. And so evidently Esau had been out in the woods. He'd been out hunting, been out looking for something. He comes in after a long day and he walks in and there's his brother Jacob, just cooked up some soup. He's starving and says, give me some soup. But Jacob, remember what his name means? Trickster. He sees this as an opportunity to get what he wants. And so he's gonna take advantage of this moment. Verse 31, listen to what happened. Jacob says, all right, but trade me. Get this, trade me your rights as the firstborn son. He says, I want the privileges. I want everything. I want the rights that come along with being the firstborn son. Because in that day and age, everybody would get an inheritance and a blessing. But if you were the firstborn, you would get a double portion. The firstborn would get two houses, where the second would get one house. The firstborn would get two jet skis and the second one would get one jet ski. The the firstborn would get two pieces of pizza. The the, the second one would get one piece of pizza. You get what's going on? And so just because they were the firstborn, they would get double the portion. And this bothered Jacob his entire life because he was 36, 30 or, or minutes, I mean, just behind his older brother. And so he knows he's not in line. He knows he's not the one that's gonna get this. And so now he makes a determination. I'm gonna do whatever I've gotta do, whether it's to lie, steal, manipulate, or cheat, to get exactly what I want. And so he seizes the opportunity. Look at what it says, verse 32. Look, I'm dying of starvation, Esau said. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore in oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt, say contempt. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. And so here you have Esau rejecting his spiritual blessing for a bowl of soup. And can we just all agree on something here together as a church? Soup is not a meal. It is an appetizer, that's what soup is, all right? And so this blows my mind that for an appetizer, this guy would have given up his birthright. Now, like a tomahawk steak and lobster mac and cheese, now we're gonna have a conversation, right? But for a bowl of soup, 
But this just shows you the contempt that Esau had for spiritual things, the contempt that he had for his birthright. And so Esau walks away with a full belly. Jacob walks away with the blessings of God. He gets the right thing the wrong way. And both of these boys, they dishonor God. They both get exactly what they want, like father, like son. I mean, it's so sad. It's so sad. I mean, this is, and Isaac sets all of this up. And I said this back when we were looking at the life of Abraham. I'm gonna repeat it again because it's so important. Those things in our life, those things in our life that are not good, that are not healthy, those sins that maybe we've inherited from somebody else, if we don't transform those things, we will transfer them to somebody else. That stuff in our life that we don't transform by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, by the power of the gospel, if we don't transform those things, all we're gonna do is we're gonna to transfer it on to the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. And so Isaac's home life is a mess. The relationships he has under his roof are, are, are not good, but guess what? His work life, his, his life outside the home, it's not much better. Let's flip over to chapter 26, and we're gonna quickly look at something that happens that's gonna make you go, huh? In verse 26, or chapter 26, verse one says this. A severe famine now struck the land, as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. And so just like happened to his mom and dad, uh, uh, there was a famine that hit the land. And so instead of staying put, they pack up their tents, pack up their people, and they move west towards the Mediterranean to where the Philistines are, and they go over there with this guy by the name of, as, of Abimelech. Now you're going, well, is that the same Abimelech? Odds are the name Abimelech is actually a title for somebody. And so he goes over there to the Philistines just like his dad did. Verse seven, when the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebecca, he said, she is my what? Sister. He was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought they will kill me to get her because she is so beautiful. And some of you are going, hold on a second, pastor. Haven't we read this before? Yes, we have, like father, like son. Not once, but twice. His father, Abraham, did the exact same thing. He did it over in Egypt, and he did it also in this area of Gerar. He did the exact same thing, almost verbatim, said the exact same words. I'm afraid for my life, and so I'm gonna put my wife out there as my sister, put her at risk to save my own butt. I mean, twice. Twice, Isaac's father does the exact same thing, like father, like son. And how did it work out for Abraham? Not too well. Well, guess what? <laughs> like father, like son. It's not gonna work out well for Isaac. Verse eight, but some time later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing. Say caressing. Listen, you don't need to be a Hebrew linguist to translate that word, do you? I'm just making sure, all right? All right, well, we're gonna read on. So, so, so I looked out the window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, she is obviously not your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get her for me, Isaac replied. I mean, here is Abimelech. He looks out his window and he sees Isaac and Rebekah doing things that brothers and sisters don't do, all right? caressing one another and calls me and is like, dude, what gives? What are you doing? Why in the world did you lie to me? And then he repeats almost verbatim what his father said. I was afraid that I would be killed. I mean, it just blows my mind like father, like son. Verse 10, how could you do this to us? Abimelech exclaimed. One of my people might have easily taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. And so here, once again, one of our patriarchs, one of the people that God is choosing to work through to bring his son Jesus into this world is called out by a non-believer because of their behavior, because of their integrity, because they weren't living God-like. And so Isaac, just like his father Abraham, gets the same treatment. And this creates incredible tensions, as you might imagine, between Isaac and Abimelech. In fact, listen to what they do, verse 15. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. 
These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. And you gotta understand, in that day and age, especially in that part of the world, water is life. And so here they are, Abimelech is plain dirty, no pun intended, as he is filling these wells. And what he's doing is trying to force Isaac to leave. And so it goes on to say, verse 19, Isaac's servants also dug in the, in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said. And they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Essek, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well. But again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at last, the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. And so he digs two wells and he ends up naming them arguments and hostility. And then he digs a third and finally there's peace because it's far enough away. But what we're about to see is this pagan leader, this King Abimelech, he decides that he is going to be the mature one and he is going to seek reconciliation. Reconciliation. And let me go ahead and make this point because we're gonna come back to this time and time again over the next several weeks. We need to seek reconciliation, not resolution. In our relationships, we need to seek reconciliation, not resolution. In our stressed out relationships, in our fractured relationships, we need to seek reconciliation, not resolution. It's not about being right. It's about being in a right relationship. And so we're gonna see this play out time and time again and hear this pagan king, hear this non-believer who called out Isaac for his wrong living, for his lack of integrity, is going to move towards the middle and say, hey, we need to make this right. We need to reconcile here. And so listen to what happens in verse 28. He says, we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. So we wanna enter into a sworn treaty with you. Let's make a covenant. Swear that, that you will not harm us just as we have not troubled you. We have always treated you well and, and we sent you away from us in peace. And so now look how the Lord has blessed you. And so Abimelech is making peace here. He's extending the olive branch. He's not trying to be heard. He, he's not trying to, to prove his point. He's not trying to win this argument. He says, let's regroup, let's recenter, and let's reconcile and let's find peace in this relationship. And so Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate the treaty and they ate and drank together. Early the next morning, they each took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. Then Isaac sent them home again and they left him in peace. Reconciliation over resolution. Because if, if Abimelech hadn't have been the mature one, the crazy cycle would still be going on. But he stopped that crazy cycle. He stopped the dysfunction. He stopped all that by seeking resolution, not seeking rec re uh, reconciliation, not resolution. And again, passing on the traits of a father. I mean, Isaac should have known better. Isaac's private life and his personal life, Isaac's his public life was a mess. Issues at home with his boys playing favorites created a two decade split that we're gonna read about in a couple of weeks. Put his wife at risk by once again lying and calling her a sister. I mean, he operates his business with a lack of integrity and lies and it creates a, a situation for he and his entire household. And then he gets called out by a non-believer for the way that he's living his life. And again, like father, like son. Like father, like son. And the stuff that has been running through his family is continuing to run through his family. And what you see behind Isaac is this, this trail of, of broken, stressed, and fractured relationships. And thank goodness in this story for this non-believer, thank goodness for, for King Abimelech, who gives us a little bit of hope that if we seek reconciliation, that we can find peace in our relationships. And, and so let me just ask you this question. Is there a string, is there a trail of broken fractured relationships behind you? Maybe it's your marriage, an ex-wife or an ex-husband. Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your brother or your sister, or maybe it's the in-laws. Maybe it's some friends. Maybe it's a boss, it's a coworker. Maybe it's somebody at church. Who is it in your life? Who is it in your life right now that that relationship is a bit strained, it's a bit stressed, and maybe it's 
fracture. And what are we doing about it? Are we circling our wagons? Are we building our defense? Are we trying to prove that we are the right one? Are we attacking them through social media? Are we using surrogates to go and, and defend our position? Are we freezing them out? Are, 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 we, are we making decisions that we're just gonna cut them out of our lives and every time we get together, it's incredibly intense? Let me ask you this question. Who's gonna be the mature one? Who's gonna be the mature one that's gonna step in and say, you know what, it's not about being right. It's about reconciliation. It's about finding peace. So here's what I wanna do in the last couple of moments I have with you. I wanna give you four practical ways that we all can seek reconciliation. And we're gonna buzz through them today pretty quickly because we're gonna come back to these time and time again over the next eight weeks. And look at a couple of these principles that we can apply to our relationships that might be a bit stressed, that might be a bit fractured. And these are ways that we can find relationship rehab, that we can bring some reconciliation to these relationships. And so I'm gonna give you four practical things we can do in one prayer. So if you're taking notes, you wanna write these down. First one is this, take ownership. Take ownership. Own your part of the situation. Because the truth is, and I've been doing this long enough and I've been in relationships long enough, and no matter what fracture, fracture there may be, no matter what stress there may be, I know that, that there's always, as they say, it takes two to tango. And so I need to own my part. What, what's the part that I played? What did I cause? And maybe I'm not the one who caused the initial incident, but I'm the one who reacted. And so what part do I need to own? I mean, listen to what Jesus said about this. He said, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your own eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Own, take ownership of the part you might've played. Number two, shift perspective, shift perspective perspective and in the middle of it in the moment it sometimes it's hard to see outside of our own point of view out of our own perspective and so maybe we just need to pause for a moment and ask ourselves a couple questions I mean what are their needs do you even know their needs if I stepped into their shoes if I stepped where they are what are they thinking it's important for us to to take a moment to shift our perspective Listen again to what it says in the Bible. Philippians chapter two, verse four says, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Number three, hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. Man, I know there are times, there are times in marriages, there are times in families, there are times in, 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 in our work relationships, there are times in our friendships where the situation seems so bleak that it's a lost cause, that it seems hopeless. But remember, we serve a God who brings dead things back to life. We serve a God who, who gives us the gospel that it's all about breathing life back into dead things. And so maybe, just maybe, you think that relationship that you're struggling with, that, that relationship is fractured, that there is no hope, hold on to hope. And sometimes just holding on a little bit longer is all that relationship needs to find reconciliation. Listen again to what the Word of God says. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Is there somewhere in your life, is there a relationship in your life right now that is stressed and fractured and you believe it's beyond hope? Please encourage, I wanna encourage you to just give it a little bit of hope and believe in the power of God to bring dead things back to life. And then lastly, exercise lots and lots and lots of grace. Exercise lots of grace. Relationships require a lot of grace because we do things intentionally and unintentionally to one another. But remember what the word of God says, Jesus said, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave their sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled. Be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. We all have got to learn the arts. We've all got to learn the practice. We all have got to learn the discipline of forgiveness. Because if not, that hurt is gonna turn into resentment. That resentment is gonna turn into pain. That pain is gonna turn into bitterness. That bitterness is gonna turn into hate. And that hate is gonna eat us up from the inside out. 
Jesus challenged each and every one of us to give what we have received. And I don't know about you, but I know in my life, Jesus has given me far more grace than I've ever given to anybody else. And Jesus is very clear to those of us who have been given much, much is required. And so who is it in your life? Who is that person right now that you might need to reconcile with? Who is that, that person right now that maybe there's some tension, maybe there's, there's a fracture in your relationship? I wanna encourage you over the next couple of weeks to spend some time thinking about that. In fact, in the back of your workbook, you'll see a relationship inventory section where we just put some questions back here for all of us to kind of work through and to think through. Are, are there relationships in my life that need reconciliation? Who do I need to be praying for? What do I need to be praying for? What do I need to do? And the commitment to say to God that I'm gonna do my best, I'm gonna work towards reconciliation. I wanna encourage you to take some time this week to just work through that. Because here's what I need you to know. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. God has the power to bring healing and reconciliation to your relationships. And here's maybe the most important thing you can do right now, and maybe this is the only thing you can do in that relationship, is you can do exactly what Abraham and Isaac did. You see, not all the things they did were bad. They passed down some good things. And both times these guys made mistakes, they went and made themselves right with God, and they prayed. And so I'm gonna ask us throughout the series to pray a simple prayer all throughout the series. In fact, on your way in, you were given this card. And what I want you to do is go ahead and take this out here for a second. And I just want us to, to read this prayer together. And these cards that you'll get, if you didn't get one on the way in, please get one on the way out. You can take these, you can stick it on the mirror, you can stick it on your Bible. I wanna encourage you to get one of these. And I just want you to read this prayer with me out loud. Here we go. Father, please heal my stressed out and fractured relationships. Help me to own my own junk. Give me the eyes to see others and move to meet their needs. Fill me with your hope and grace and help me to give to others what you have given to me. Let's commit over the next couple of weeks as we walk through the lives of, of Isaac and Jacob to pray this prayer over the relationships in our lives that we need to reconcile. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together here today and to be reminded through, through your word that there is hope but there is a possibility of, of, of bringing these stressed out and fractured relationships to a place of reconciliation and peace. We pray for healing in those relationships. We pray that the God who can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, the God who brings dead things back to life, the God who's got the power to do that, to exercise the same power in our relationships. And so Jesus, would you draw us near? Would you begin to transform us so those things that run through our family can stop with us. And we can pass along generational blessings to our kids and our grandkids and to everyone we have relationship with. We love you, Jesus, less of us and more of you. It's in your name we pray, amen.
resolve our sin issue because the truth is not a single one of us could ever resolve the sin issue. He sent Jesus to reconcile that issue for us. While we were sinners, he died for us. So would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we come to you in this moment of communion to say thank you. Thank you that in our sin that you came and you paid the price. You took what each and every one of us deserved so that we can experience grace and forgiveness. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. And so we come to you in this moment to take this piece of bread. And as we eat this bread, Jesus, we remember your body that you laid on the cross for us. Let's remember Jesus. In the same way, we hold this cup that is filled with juice. And here in just a moment, we will drink this cup. Jesus, you drank the cup that we should have drank. You drank the bitterness of our sins and you transformed that through your grace and your forgiveness to eternal life. And so as we drink from this cup, Jesus, we remember you. Jesus, we love you, we thank you, we need you. Help us to never forget that while we were sinners, you died for us. And that same joy we have, that same gratitude we have, that same grace and forgiveness and love that we experience, help us to leverage that in each and every one of our relationships so that what we can pass on, not just to our families, but to our friendships and to the world around us is an example of exactly what you have done for every man, woman, and child. Jesus, we love you. You are our living hope. It's in your name we pray. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
guys can now turn your attention to the Baspo baptismal pool. Good morning, church family. Um, this is my son, Mason Van Scoy, and uh, I have the privilege of um, baptizing him today. So it's probably the most uh, important decision of his life uh, because it's uh, eternal and not just temporal, which most uh, decisions that we make in this life are. Mason, if you'll uh, repeat after me in church, um, I, believe I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son the Son of the living God, and I accept him, and I accept him as, my Lord and Savior. as my Lord and Savior. By your confession, Lord, or by your confession, Mason, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. It was such a wonderful time worshiping with you all this morning. Um, if you guys wanted to get connected and to give, feel free to tap the tags behind your chairs with your phones. Um, if you'd like additional prayer, um, we'll have our leaders come up to the front. Uh, but we just thank you for joining us this weekend, and we hope you have a blessed week.